Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you're having a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is this crackdown we've seen in the UK over this past weekend. You may have seen the headlines recently, like this one from the Daily Beast. Three far right wing figures were denied entry to the UK. And the three people they're talking about are Brittany Pettibone, Martin Sellner, and Lauren Southern. And this happened in two different instances. Sellner, who's a leader in the Austrian identitarian movement, he was reportedly on his way to speak at an anti-immigrant event held at London Speaker's Corner. But according to Pettibone's paperwork, they were denied entry to the UK on the basis that their visit would be a, quote, serious threat to the fundamental interests of society and are likely to incite tensions between local communities in the United Kingdom. Both ended up being released on Sunday and the pair went back to Vienna. Pettibone saying, it felt like they were saying, you're right wing, that's not allowed. And then today we had a situation with Lauren Southern. Lauren tweeting out, investigated me under Schedule 7, Terrorism Act, because of alleged racism. At least they let me identify as Pakistani on my report, lol, still being held by police. Later tweeting, they locked me out and said au revoir. Officially banned from UK for racism, doing fine though. All the cool people are being banned anyway. Need to gather my thoughts and call family. Interrogation story is pretty crazy though, we'll tell soon. Later adding, I'm not kidding about this, but during my questioning by the UK police, I was asked about my Christianity and whether I'm a radical. I was also asked how I feel about running Muslims over with cars. And according to Lauren Southern's paperwork, she was denied entry due to an incident where she held up signs that said, Allah is a gay god. And so therefore her presence in the UK would be a quote, serious threat to the fundamental interests of society. And as you'd expect, this has stirred up a debate on is this the right thing to do? People saying that this is extreme, this is a crackdown on freedom of speech. But on the other side, you have people saying, no, this is the crackdown on hate speech, people purposefully agitating. And I will say personally, it has nothing to do with agreeing or disagreeing with what they have said in the past. The idea that you are not allowing someone to the country based off of things they've said in the past that have been very critical of Islam and immigration, that's crazy to me. And it makes me think of the supposed reasoning behind the Lauren Southern allies gay sign. Reportedly, that was in response to a Vice article that asked whether Jesus was gay or not. And reportedly, that experiment was conducted to see what kind of reaction this would get. And so if you flip the situation and it was someone trying to get into the UK who who is very anti-Christianity, who maybe also goes around saying anyone that wants completely shut borders, they're a Nazi. Would that person be barred entry? And also, should that person be barred entry? I think that whenever possible, when we're trying to think about a situation, we, we flip it just to see how we would react. But with that said, I want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts on this story? Good thing, bad thing, misplaced priorities for the UK or no? Let me know in those comments down below. Then, because apparently someone over at Netflix was like, Netflix isn't quite addicting enough, even though we literally have a feature on Netflix that's like, are, are you are you sure you're still watching this show and you didn't just leave it running? No, Netflix, it was raining in LA on the weekend and I didn't feel like going out onto the road and driving with a bunch of people that don't understand precipitation. That's the excuse I'm using for being a garbage person today. But those changes that I was mentioning before my rant are actually test targeted at children. The new system essentially grants patches for watching certain shows. Some of the shows that were tested include Fuller House, Trolls, a series of unfortunate events, and essentially it's the attempt to game five viewing experiences on Netflix for children. And while this on its own is kind of interesting, I also wonder if people are gonna call out the timing around this. It's a move aimed at children, obviously trying to increase watch times with children, getting people into their system as they grow up. But at the same time, we're seeing studies that are claiming that excessive viewing times of, of TV, of tablets, it is actually harmful for children. And so I'm personally interested to see if this test becomes a new full-fledged feature, or if they end up pulling it back, killing the program because of outrage that comes out. Personally, I'm of the mindset that the responsibility falls on the parents, but that might not fully matter in a move that seems so heavily targeted specifically towards the children. Then, in a quickie update to a story we covered last week, Martin Shkreli, of course, the farmer bro. Where we left off, the judge said that Shkreli was responsible for $10.4 million in losses. And one of the main reasons that number would likely matter is it could affect his sentencing, which was Friday. Shkreli's lawyers were trying to get less than two years. Prosecutors want 15. The judge kind of just split it down the middle and gave him seven years in prison. Also, according to a vice correspondent, before he was sentenced, Martin Shkreli just started crying in the courtroom. And also, another point that that same writer pointed out, it's important to remember that Shkreli is serving seven years not because he raised the price massively. We're talking 5,000% of a drug that helps people live their lives, saves their lives. A disgusting, unforgivable thing that people in the pharmaceutical industry do on a regular basis, but because he defrauded other rich people and now he has to pay the price. And I'm not saying that Shkreli should not have faced punishment for that, but it, it is just very telling who gets prosecuted for what. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in Awesome, brought to you by Postmates. Postmates, of course, a fantastic delivery on demand app. You want something from the store, a restaurant, open up the app, boom, they deliver it to your house, your office, your wherever. With the hours I've been working lately, it has become vital to my life. So if you want to check it out, go to postafranco.com, download the app, make sure you enter an offer code FILLED, and they will give you $100 in free delivery credit. And the first bit of Awesome is a trailer for Sorry to Bother You, which looks like an amazing movie. It stars Lakeith Stanfield, who I feel like is a really underrated actor. I mean, you've probably seen him in bits of 
Love, Selma, Dope, Snowden, and then of course most recently Get Out and Atlanta on FX. Who, by the way, is probably one of my favorite parts of that show. The main point, enjoy the trailer and get excited about July 6th. Then we had the slow-mo guys doing Paint Blast Portrait in 4K. Nerdist gave us Tommy Wiseau's Joker audition tape. Saturday Night Live gave us a brand new Black Panther scene. And if you want to see the full versions of everything, I just share the secret link of the day, anything at all. Links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about the crashes in the news. Last night, there was a helicopter crash in New York's East River. The crash was caught on several cameras, and while it appeared light, five passengers ended up dying. The only person that survived and was able to escape was the pilot. And while there's currently an investigation into this crash, why did it happen? We're also now starting to get information. And according to reports, the pilot of that helicopter suggested a passenger's gear somehow interfered with the helicopter's operation. And we'll have to wait to see if there's more information that comes out, but that was also not the only crash in the news. A plane carrying 71 people crashed in Nepal today. As of recording this video, 49 people have been killed. Now, as far as the reason for this crash, the airline has blamed bad air traffic control, but we also have authorities in Nepal saying that the plane made what they called an unusual landing. And as far as why we're getting this he said, she said, the Director General of the Civil Aviation Authority of Nepal said the aircraft was permitted to land from the southern side of the runway, but it landed from the northern side. But the airline's chief executive said there were wrong directions from the tower. Our pilot is not at fault. One of the survivors of the crash also raised another red flag, saying that there seemed to be an issue before they even landed, saying after a normal takeoff from Dhaka, the plane had begun to behave strangely, adding all of a sudden the plane shook violently and there was a loud bang afterwards. What's also interesting about this crash is it is the third commercial airline's crash to result in death in 2018. In fact, it's the third commercial airline crash in just the past 30 days. This all of a sudden happening after a 2017 where we saw zero deaths in this manner. But that's where we are as of right now with, of course, some of the numbers potentially changing because some of those injured were in critical condition. And I'm not saying that it's happening for any reason. It just, it really does stand out after a year of no deaths, at least commercial airlines wise, three and 30 days, I don't know. And then let's talk about the most recent wave of Twitter bans. On Friday, Twitter smacked down multiple accounts that have been accused of joke stealing. Some of the accounts affected included girl posts, Dory, common white girl, so damn true, and meme provider. Here's one example of a stolen tweet where they, they didn't even change anything. Sometimes you'll see them change a word or two, but then other times like this, it is just blatant. Now the crackdown isn't actually a surprising move from Twitter. The company has been very vocal recently about cracking down on spam and in particular, TweetDeck. TweetDeck, if you don't know, is a Twitter app that lets users create groups of profiles, schedule posts, post to several accounts at once, and suspended accounts like girl posts and so damn true people would steal content like memes and jokes and then put it on a shared tweet deck. Then the accounts in the tweet deck would band together and retweet each other's stolen content to make it go viral. This process was so successful, brands actually paid administrators for access to the collected content, also known as decks. And accounts in the tweet deck would sell their retweets to brands and people who wanted to go viral. Now, all of that said, when we look at the big picture, it doesn't appear that this move from Twitter is primarily focused on Twitter accounts that steal jokes. This appears to be part of Twitter's enforcement on spam. In January, Twitter announced that they would be making changes to TweetDeck. Last month, the company laid out those specific changes in a blog post, saying one of the most common spam violations we see is the use of multiple accounts in the Twitter developer platform to attempt to artificially amplify or inflate the prominence of certain tweets. Do not and do not allow your users to simultaneously perform actions such as likes, retweets, or follows from multiple accounts. And then, seemingly the most telling of what they were actually targeting, they say posting multiple updates on a single account or across multiple accounts you control to a trending or popular topic, for instance, through the use of a specific hashtag with an intent to subvert or manipulate the topic or to artificially inflate the prominence of a hashtag or topic is never allowed. It seems like the war that's actually taking place is against information manipulation. We've seen stories in the past year about trending topics that made their way there because of Russian bots. And one of the ways these bots and other bad actors work is very similar to what these joke stealers have been doing. Coordinated pushes to make the content they are promoting go viral. And the main differences between the two of these groups obviously impact and also general intent. One is to make more money, the other is to at least cause chaos. That said, for me personally, if some of the accounts caught in the crossfire are just notorious joke stealers, fan fucking tastic. There, there, there is parallel thinking. There's sometimes accidentally saying something incredibly similar to another joke that someone made. And then there is the unapologetic stealing we see from many of these bad actors. Unfortunately, I believe that it's just a matter of time until they bounce back in a different way or they thrive somewhere else. But any inconvenience whatsoever, makes me happy. And then let's talk about lawmakers in Florida voting on a ban, although it might not be the one that you're thinking of. Obviously, the past few weeks, there's been a lot of talk about guns and legislation around guns in Florida, but what I'm talking about today is child marriage. And for multiple reasons with this story, I think it is important that we share Sherry Johnson's story. Sherry Johnson's rapist was a church deacon who started attacking her when she was nine years old. And by the time she was 10, she was pregnant with his child. And reportedly, when her church found out about the crimes, they pressured the mother to have the daughter marry the man, which a judge approved. At the time of 
this marriage, she was 11 years old and he was 20. And reportedly the abuse continued for years and during that time, Johnson gave birth to five more kids before she escaped the marriage. Now her child marriage happened 47 years ago, but many children today can still legally get married. And so Sherry has spent the last six years fighting to make sure no child goes through what she did. Which then brings us to current law in Florida. Now currently in Florida, if you're 16 or 17 years old, you can get married, but you have to have the consent of both of your parents. That is, unless there is a pregnancy involved, in which case there is no minimum age for marriage as long as a judge approves. And according to a frontline analysis of child marriage in the United States, more than 16,000 minors were married in Florida between 2000 and 2015. And a legislative staff analysis showed that between 2012 and 2016, over 1,800 marriage licenses were issued in Florida to couples when at least one party was a minor. This included a 13-year-old, seven 14-year-olds, and 29 15-year-olds. There was even an example where a guy who was 90 years old was able to marry a 16 or 17 year old. So that said, on Friday, Sherry was hailed as a hero because the Florida legislature passed a bill changing rules for child marriage. State lawmakers have repeatedly cited Sherry Johnson as an inspiration to change the law. And while there were some initial disagreements because the House wanted carve-outs for certain 16 and 17 year olds, ultimately we now have a single bill. A bill that's been approved by both Florida House and Senate. It is headed to the governor's desk and it sets limits on the marriage of 17 year olds. Pregnancy is no longer a factor. And now anyone marrying a 17 year old can't be more than two years older and the child would need parental consent. And it's essentially a done deal. Governor Rick Scott said that he will sign the bill. What's also interesting about the bill is that it was almost universally approved. In the House, it was passed by a vote of 109 to one. The single no vote came from Republican Representative George Moritis. While he didn't say anything on the floor, if we look about a month before to a quote that he gave, it kind of gives some insight. At that time, he said, I'm particularly focused on the pregnancy aspect of it. I don't want the message to be that it's better to not get married. So there was that. Now, all of this said about Florida, it's important to point out that this is also a nationwide issue. While 18 is typically the minimum age, every state seems to have legal loopholes or exceptions allowing marriage at a younger age. According to Unchained at Last, a group campaigning to abolish child marriage, at least 207,468 minors were married in the United States between 2000 and 2015. In the last two years, we've seen Virginia, Texas, Kentucky, New York, all voting to ban or limit child marriages, but we've also seen other states struggle. New Hampshire was considering a bill to raise the minimum marriage age, but that was killed after a recent push from a handful of Republicans. In Tennessee, House Republicans also killed a bill late last week that sought to ban child marriage, but this also seemed to be part of a bigger thing. Attorney and former state Senator David Fowler argued that it would hurt his effort to challenge the Supreme Court's 2015 decision that legalized same-sex marriage. So therefore, according to Fowler, if the state were to move forward changing anything around marriage, it would then disqualify that they really thought that all marriages were nullified by the Supreme Court decision. And ultimately, while it would make a change here, it would be self-defeating in the Supreme Court. And this move was outrageous to a lot of people because essentially you're dealing with a situation where, where the argument for, for not shutting down child marriages is you're not a fan of gay marriages. And considering the story stories around child marriage that have been coming out of Tennessee, it can be infuriating. Frontline's investigation found that Tennessee had the youngest married children in the country. This, including 10-year-old girls who have been married to men between the ages of 24 to 31. We've also seen a story of an 11-year-old boy who had been married to a 27-year-old woman in Tennessee. And then that brings us to Missouri, whose current laws are the most lenient for child marriages. It has even been called a destination wedding spot for child marriages in some circles. Part of the reason for that is Missouri is the only state that requires only the signature of one parent, even if the other parent objects for ages of 15, 16, and 17 years old. Additionally, like half of all states, Missouri has no minimum age to marry, but it requires anyone 14 and under to get a judge's approval. Which if you haven't picked up on by this point, I think is batshit crazy. We're talking about people who are in sexual relationships that are considered statutory rape. And in some cases, we're seeing the children marry to protect the partners from prison. I mean, we're talking about situations where from a legal standpoint, it isn't understood that this person is so young, they cannot consent to sex. But because there's a baby or someone approved a 10 year old marrying someone between the age of 24 and 31, it's all good. That's crazy. It feels insane that we have to say there's a law to stop this, but based off of a lot of the reporting and stuff that we've found out over the years, it needs to be done. But that said, that's where I'm gonna end that story today and pass the question off to you. What are your what are your thoughts around this story? I know we have an international audience, some, some diverse thoughts, and so I'd love to know what you think in those comments down below. And that's where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I'm trying to do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, since YouTube's notifications recently are kind of like, if we feel like it, I recommend following me on Twitter, at Philly D. I always link out when the new video is out. But yeah, that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been been filled in. I love your faces and I'll see you tomorrow.